Good afternoon, everyone. I'm hoping that you can hear us. This is Tammy Moore. I'm the CEO of ALS Canada, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar today on how to get involved in advocacy for access to ALS therapies. I will let you know that just by a matter of some of the housekeeping duties, this webinar is being recorded so that we can archive the presentation and share a link for those people who are unable to participate today. As we have many people joining us, it's uh, we had over 100 people registered. We are going to be muting all lines so that we're able to uh, manage the sound and we don't end up with a lot of background noise. We also suggest that if you would like, you could manually mute your phone or computer microphone as well, just to help make sure there's no background noise or disruption, as we want everyone to be able to hear the presentation clearly. We do want to be able to take questions and so there is a question box that is in the webinar. So if you could, please put your question, type it into there, and we will be holding all the questions until the end of the presentation. Um, and so please be patient as we address the questions because we anticipate that we could have some from having this many people on the call. So as we move to the next slide, which is our agenda, Uh, we just like to cover off what we're looking at taking care of today. So first of obviously, um, welcome from ALS Canada. We're going to be doing a bit of an introduction to advocacy, an overview of the drug approval and reimbursement process in Canada. Um, as you know, the, the drug approval and reimbursement is new for both the Canadian ALS community as well as our organization. We've had lots of learning over the past two years We've brought on partners to assist us with the work that has to be done in this area, and we've engaged organizations, either other health charities or consultants with specific skills and expertise to be able to help us navigate this area. Today, I'm pleased to say, is another step as we look to engage our community differently than we have been, around, than we have been able to do in the past around this issue. We will be looking at the advocacy campaign that we are looking at for access to Radicava, how you can participate, and then, as I mentioned, answering your questions and answers at the end of it. So ultimately, what we want to get from today, just advancing the slides, is one, we want to be able to provide you with an overview of the drug access pathway, both from approval all the way through to reimbursement. We want to learn about, the, we want to share with you the current opportunities to advocate for access. And we want to find out what, or we want to make sure that um, we share with you what you can do and how we can work together to advance these issues. And really, at the end of the day, we were wanting to confirm your interest in engaging with us on the next step. We'll be providing the overview of the situations and the issues relating to equitable and timely access to therapies for all Canadians. So as we start off, we want to introduce you to some of the people who are around the table here at ALS Canada and who will be joining us on the call. So um, we have both myself, or we have myself, Tammy Moore, as I mentioned, I'm the CEO of ALS Canada, and I've been involved with the advocacy efforts here in our organization for six years, even when I was first coming onto the board and first came into, the, into our community. Lisa Marquito, our Vice President of Marketing and Public Affairs, will be sharing with you some of the technical background about where we are today on the drug access pathway. And Lauren Popluck, our Manager of Public Affairs and Communications, is here at the controls helping us to manage and navigate our webinar today. We'll also be having be joined by Norma Kaisek, Community Advocate and Champion. And later on in the presentation, Advocacy Solutions, uh, Brian, who is the president and his team of that organization. I would like to express my appreciation for the many other community members who ha have been participating either informally or formally as we are advocating on this issue. In some of the previous images, you saw some of the group, which would include Mike Ranney, as well as Phil Duff, and many others. So now I'm hoping that Norm has joined our call. I will unmute him and I think it should work. So just as a brief introduction, Norm McIsaac is a member of the National Advocacy Committee for the Federation of ALS Societies across the country. 
He's also a board member of ALS Quebec, and he's been with us um, advocating on Parliament Hill. And in this image that you see of Norm, that was one of our days with the Federal ALS Caucus led by Francis Durand. And in the past, Norm, in his previous work, has also been involved in a lot of advocacy efforts relating to the NGO that he was previously working with. So Norm, I invite you to provide some your comments as we open this webinar. I've unmuted him. So Norm, I'm hoping that your computer is also unmuted and you're able to use the um, use your phone for helping to address the group. All right, we seem to be having a little bit of a technical issue with being able to have Norm join us. So Norm, maybe when we can resolve our technical issue, we will have you share your comments at that time. So now I would like to introduce you to um, Lisa Marquito, um, so that we can talk about the issues relating to access to Radicaba. Lisa. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so many of you would have, um, in seeing the opportunity to be part of this webinar, uh, would have seen uh, a reference to, to the main issue that we're able to address today, which is around access to Radicaba. Um, if you've been following um, this drug on its way through the, the pathway, uh, you'll know that uh, it was approved by Health Canada uh, about a year ago in October of 2018, uh, and it's received a couple of positive funding recommendations, and we'll talk over the rest of the webinar about what exactly that means. Um, but despite uh, those steps that it's made through the drug access pathway, it is still not accessible through public reimbursement to people living with ALS. And I think that oftentimes there's a tendency to to think that once a drug is approved, it means it's automatically available to everybody uh, at um, little to no cost. Uh, the system doesn't work like that, and we're finding that out um, through this experience that we're kind of uh, living in, in real time right now with the recognition that um, there isn't time to wait or, or waste for this access to happen. So what we're really interested in is making sure that people who could benefit from access to this therapy have the access in a timely, equitable, and affordable way. And the opportunity that's ahead of us uh, and, and working hopefully with many of you, um, there's an opportunity for us to work together to advocate for uh, private but primarily public drug plans um, to provide access for Canadians to be able to access Radicava without any further delays. And we'll talk a little bit later about kind of what, what that could look like to advocate for it and, and also provide you with a better understanding of um, where the delays come from and how we can influence them. So in terms of the progress to date, um, and I've spoken to this a little bit already, there was approval from the FDA in the United States in May of 2017. And then um, the company applied, the, the manufacturing company of the drug applied to Health Canada for priority review in the spring of 2018. Um, uh, Ryan and team, I don't want to steal your thunder, but uh, typically when something receives a, a priority review from Health Canada, it takes about six months. Um, versus, a hundred, uh, versus a year, um, which is the, the typical, again, a bit too long than, than we'd like it to be, but it was approved by Health Canada in October. What Health Canada approval means is basically that the drug is authorized to be sold in Canada. It doesn't address any of the, the questions about um, pricing or cost or any of those things, and the Advocacy Solutions team will provide a little bit more insight into that in a little while. Earlier this year, in uh, January and March of 2019, we saw positive reimbursement recommendations from two um, government agencies uh, that uh, play a role in recommending to the provinces whether or not uh, the, the provinces should be um, putting public funds towards making those drugs available and paying for them. 
So there were positive reimbursements with conditions from both the uh, Quebec organization um, called INES and CADIS, which is the organization that does those re reviews and recommendations for the rest of Canada. Um, there are a lot of acronyms in, in this world that we've been quickly familiarizing ourselves with, and so we'll be um, orienting you to some of those as well. In terms of why this work is important, um, an expedited process is, is something that we want to be sure to influence, and we want to see equitable access about, across Canada because we're in a position now where there hasn't been an ALS therapy approved by Health Canada. Before Radicava, it was 20 or so years ago, um, again, speaking to the learning um, that we're all doing together. But because there hasn't been an ALS therapy approved by Health Canada in 20 years up until this point, we recognize that this process that we're going through now um, in observing how Radicava is kind of making its way through its precedent setting. Um, so there's an opportunity now for us to advocate in a way that could be beneficial for future therapies that, that may be coming to market. We know that there is a strong pipeline for ALS therapies with um, many in phase uh, two and some in phase three. Uh, clinical trials at this point. So we want to take this opportunity with Radicava um, to advocate so that as additional therapies come to market, we'll all collectively in a better, be in a, in a better position and can see additional therapies come forward as well. Okay. Oh, and I oh think, that is Norm. Yes, I think we have Norm now. So Norm, would you like to say a few words? Hello, can you hear me? We can, loud and clear. Thank you, Norm. Oh, that was a technical struggle. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for putting up with it and sorting your way through. Thank you. Um, shall I begin? Yes, please. So I just wanted to speak briefly and say that when I was diagnosed, in 2014, there was only one drug for ALS, Rilazole. That was it. And there was not too much research underway. But now we're at a time of great hope for ALS, five years after the ice bucket challenge. There must be almost 100 treatments in the pipeline new treatments that are on the not too distant horizon. But I think you share my fear that getting those treatments is taking too much time. We know now that equitable and timely access to therapies is our new challenge. It's a complicated playing field and ALS Canada has an important role in helping us to navigate this Byzantine world of drug approval. They inform us where each innovative treatment is at and what we need to do as a community to move forward. As persons with ALS, we all share a level of frustration, but also our commitment to getting things moving faster because frankly, our time is limited. Each of us has our own voice and we should use it. Some might have soft voices. Others want to voice frustration, some indignation and others share their heartfelt pleas. Every voice is valid. And taken together, we are determined to be heard. Some want to share what others write, and others may want to say things in their own words. Any way we want to get involved is valid. I'm active on Twitter, and I must say on a personal note that I miss my buddy, my buddy Eddie LeFrancois, who is my tag team butter buddy. I welcome new Twitter buddies, though, 
often retweeting ALS candidate tweets, giving us, giving each of our own personal touch and tagging key people. This webinar is our opportunity to explore how to join those cores in the same direction. Thanks for joining us. We need you. Thank you so much, Norm. We really appreciate that. And also that shout out to Eddie. I know that this would be an important consideration for him in his advocacy efforts. So now I would like to introduce Ryan Clark. He is the president of Advocacy Solutions. Brian and his team came on with us over the past year as we started to really dig into this drug access um, issue that we've been facing and as Lisa has, has drawn your attention to already. So we're pleased to be able to have Ryan and his team here today to be able to help walk us through an introduction to advocacy and then to help set us up for what we can do for the future. So Ryan, I turn it over to you. Thanks, Tammy. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Yes, sound check is great. Thanks, Ryan. Good. Excellent. Okay, so if we move to the next slide, um, let's start at the very beginning, uh, which is what is advocacy? Well, it's verbal support or, or argument for a cause or a policy. That's a dictionary definition that I'm not terribly fond of. So I've come up with one that I think is a, a little more, um, a little simpler to understand. It is, in essence, telling your story to someone. Uh, the someone could be a government official, a physician, a hospital administrator, an employer, a school principal, doesn't really matter, through various means with the express purpose of compelling them to do, or in some cases, not to do something. Uh, in advocacy, this person is known as a decision maker. Uh, she or he will be the target of your advocacy efforts. Advocacy is a process that almost always takes time to realize tangible results, even though in many cases, uh, time is of the essence. There is no one way to do it. It's very personal to your own style or your own comfort level. You don't need to be a certain kind of person. You don't need to have a certain kind of background or experience to be able to do this. You just need to find a way to do it that works for you. And of course, it's very uh, personal in terms of how much time you choose to spend doing advocacy. But maybe more than anything, it's about empowerment. It's exerting some form of control and initiating some form of action around an issue that matters to you. And then in one final note on this slide, well, we're not going to be uh, talking specifically about the role of media in advocacy today. I did want to mention uh, that going to the media is almost never the first thing we recommend. Rather, we suggest you create what we call a layering effect by undertaking various advocacy activities, one of which may ultimately uh, include media engagement. So moving to the next slide, why is advocacy important? Well, if you remember nothing else other than what's on the slide here, you really just need to remember one thing. And that's because the squeaky wheel gets the grease. That's the way advocacy works. That's the way government works, politics, any large bureaucratic institution in which you may have ever found yourself engaged. Truly speaking, uh, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. It's also important because particularly if you're engaging government, um, uh, when, when I used to work in government, it wasn't uncommon for me to have hundred files on my desk and I mention this because um, the files on top number one number two number three are all exactly the same I don't need to know what ministry it is or what jurisdiction it is or what the issues are I can tell you that the ones on top were all exactly the same and they were the same because people were engaged they were demanding change they were involved in social media they were doing all kinds of different things to make their voices heard and that's why they were on the top of the pile. The files on the bottom, the very, very bottom, they were on the bottom because, and again, I can assure you, nobody was engaged. Nobody seemed to care if anybody picked it up. And so they slowly made their way to the bottom or never made their way up to the top. And so 
Um, it's important to remember that governments will do what they want or they'll do nothing at all unless people intervene in the process. So the choice to engage should be clear. Do nothing, you can surely expect no change. Do something and things might just change. So it's a pretty stark proposition in terms of why you may want to choose to engage in advocacy with government. The next slide, the essence of good advocacy. This is the foundation. If any one of these elements is missing, you're going to have a difficult time starting to engage in advocacy, let alone get better at it. One additional point not noted on the slide is you need to give the decision maker, especially when your decision maker is in government, a chance to solve the problem before you say they're not they're before you say they're doing nothing to resolve your issue. You have to give them a chance to resolve it. Um, then if they're still ignoring you, you'll be justified in taking more assertive action moving forward. It's, it's based on a very simple premise, and that is that you can be nice and then nasty, but you can't be nasty and then nice. Within our society, it's justified if you've been trying to make change, you've been pushing forward, and nobody is helping you, nobody's engaged, nobody seems to care about your issue, and then you become more assertive. And then you sort of build up and ramp up the volume of noise that you're engaged around. That's reasonable behavior. What is not reasonable behavior, what is not accepted behavior in our society, is to come charging out and being very aggressive uh, when nobody has give, been given the chance to resolve the issue. Nobody's been engaged. Nobody's been given an opportunity to sit down and really understand what it is that you're trying uh, to do. Now, um, let me next mention the two cornerstones of advocacy, personal stories and relationships with decision makers on the next slide. Your personal story, I'll start with that one is a summary of what has happened to you as it relates to the issue at hand, your perspective on the issue based on your experience, feelings, and attitudes, and it is very much the means by which your issue comes to life. And so when you're developing your personal story and then when you are delivering your personal story, it must demonstrate how action or inaction or a policy or whatever it is has directly impacted your life or that of the person for whom you are a, a caregiver or a family member or whatever it may be. Secondly, relationships. At the heart of effective advocacy are good working relationships with key people in government or other relevant institutions. And we always encourage people to look in an organization, look for people in an organization that you're part of or within your own network to see who has established relationships with the people that you need to see. And certainly within the context of government in this country, um, it's very, very easy in many cases through networks to find connections to decision makers. It's even more so the case in provinces like uh, the provinces in Atlantic Canada or Manitoba, Saskatchewan, where the populations are small. Um, it's usually much easier uh, to, to make those connections. But we suggest you go beyond your business or professional circles to find connections and use those links to secure uh, introductions. And of course, you can always work through your virtual networks uh, or work your virtual networks through social media channels. So that concludes the, um, the uh, introductory piece to advocacy. And what I'd like to do now is go on and talk a little bit about the drug approval and reimbursement processes. The next slide is a graphic illustration of these processes. And let me pause there by emphasizing the fact that we call them processes. It is not a process, it is a series of processes that are going on, sometimes in parallel and sometimes sequentially. So the first point I'd like to make with this graphic is how new drugs become approved and available to Canadians. Uh, in the context of the time it takes for drugs to become accessible to patients. The entire process, as you can see there, can be completed in as little as eight months and take as long as several years. Now you should know that uh, there are many patient organizations and individuals in this country working to streamline and indeed speed up uh, this process. 
And while that's going on, you should also know that we and others are constantly working on opportunities to do advocacy work outside of established processes, these established processes, again, in an effort to avoid further delays. But for today, we are focusing on what on, on where we're at, uh, and that's the, uh, the later stages in this graphic, which I'll talk about in, in just a moment. So the next slide is an overview, um, a further overview of what we just saw with a few noted um, highlights here. And as Lisa said, there's a lot of acronyms to go through, and I'll try to uh, I'll try to go through them with you, and and um, and and not get too hung up on them uh, as we go along. So public drug formularies are impacted by federal, provincial, and national policies. National meaning where the provinces come together uh, and and work together, sometimes with the federal government and sometimes without the federal government. Manufacturers or drug companies submit to Health Canada for approval. That's how that works. And Health Canada is under the jurisdiction of the federal government, the exclusive jurisdiction of the federal government. The Common Drug Review uh, reviews new drugs, non-oncology drugs, uh, under the auspices of Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies in Health, that's CADIF, and they make reimbursement recommendations. So this is a critical point to remember. CADIS and by extension, one of their programs, CDR, Common Drug Review, do not make decisions. They make recommendations regarding whether a drug should be reimbursed and the criteria uh, under which a drug should be reimbursed in this, in this country. In Canada, as I trust most of you know, we have regulated prices for patented or brand name drugs through the Patented Medicine Prices Review Board, PMPRB. Part of their stated mission is to ensure that the prices of patented medicines are not, and this is their word, not mine, excessive. That's the term they use. I'm not gonna talk further about pricing in Canada, but I did wanna show it in the context of this, of this flow, these processes. Then, moving down the slide, the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance, or PCPA, conducts joint federal-provincial negotiations for brand name drugs in Canada. So, as a result of the recommendation that comes out of CADIF, then the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance, which is essentially the provinces, um, uh, negotiates uh, an individual medication in the context of whether or not it's going to be and the terms around which it'll be publicly funded. Provinces also review new drugs and make reimbursement decisions. Provinces decide. So, so far we've had recommendations and then the provinces actually decide. And it's the PCPA or the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance and provincial reimbursement I'm going to speak to uh, uh, more. At, I'm going to speak, I'm going to focus on uh, as, we, as we move along here in the next couple of slides. So, the next slide, the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance. It was established in August of 2010, and it conducts, as I said, joint provincial territorial negotiations. Their objective is to achieve greater value for publicly funded drug programs, meaning the public formularies, meaning tax dollars that are paid to purchase medications in this country. All brand name drugs coming forward for funding through uh, um, through uh, PCODER and CDR, or through the, the well, we'll focus on CDR, but through the uh, through CADIS, are considered for negotiation through the PCPA. So this is an important point. No drug is entitled to be invited into the PCPA process. So, as you'll see in a moment on the next slide, you come through with your recommendation about whether or not the drug should be funded and the criteria under which it should be funded. And then you may or may not, meaning the drug company, may or may not be invited into negotiations to conclude an agreement to ensure that drug is publicly funded in, in Canada. And then finally on the slide, the PCPA participating jurisdictions are the ones that you see uh, listed there, which includes all of the provinces. That's the most relevant point. So turning to the next slide, the actual negotiation process, um, PCPA or the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance maintains um, four tables 
and those tables are listed on the left-hand uh, side of that uh, of the slide that you're looking at. As of September 30th, and as of this morning, that's the most updated list we have. There are 48 active drug products in negotiations, meaning that right now PCPA is negotiating to publicly fund 48 medications in this country. They, PCPA, have completed 276 negotiations since their inception back in 2010 and closed 45 drug product negotiations. And when we talk about a closed um, a one, what we mean by that is that, uh, well, obviously complete means that it was successfully negotiated, but closed means that those negotiations were not successful. And when a drug is closed, it's put on a list in which uh, barring um, something different or barring some action in the future, the drug will not be publicly funded in Canada. The next list are called no negotiations. There are 69 products on that list, and those are products that received a recommendation from um, CADIS, likely a no recommendation. I believe, well, certainly the vast majority are no's, if not all of them. And so PCPA has declined to even negotiate to fund those, those drugs. Those 69 drugs will never be funded in Canada. They will never be available to people in Canada through public funding as long as they're on that list. And then finally, there's 13 drugs on the product uh, negotiations being considered by each province or territory. I, I won't get into an explanation of that one. It's very small, it's not relevant to us, um, and, it, uh, and it's very static. So note that negotiations can be unilaterally, as I say, unilaterally closed on a manufacturer. Like I said, that's the closed negotiation list, leaving patients in that particular case without access uh, to treatment. The other thing you need to know about this slide, the final thing I'll mention, is that provinces can opt out of a PCPA negotiation at any time. So if we go up to the top on the right-hand side where it says manufacturer submission and then in brackets letter of engagement. The first thing that happens um, is that the manufacturer receives a letter of engagement from PCPA saying, we would like to invite you in to negotiations. Again, these are the ones that get invited in. That letter of engagement does not have to be signed by all of the participating provinces and territories and, pe and federal drug plans that are part of PCPA. So as you saw in the previous slide, there's a list of, of um, participants, and they are the ones that have joined PCPA formally. But in any, and in any given negotiation, any one of those participants can opt out, and they can opt out at the engagement letter stage, so they don't sign the letter of engagement. They can opt out after the negotiations have begun but haven't been concluded. And then finally, they can opt out if you go down just under negotiation, they can opt out of the signing of the letter of intent. So you could have a province, sign the letter of engagement, be very active in the negotiations, and then when it comes to signing the letter of intent, and the letter of intent is the agreement between the provinces and the manufacturer about the terms under which the drug will be funded, they opt out, and this happens. This is unfortunately now becoming much more common within the context of our system. And then if we move to the, to the next slide and, and my final two slides, provinces, have, provinces and territories have and will continue to have the final word on whether a medication is publicly funded. You remember a moment ago I told you that the provinces make the final decision. And that is because of Section 92, Sub 7 of the Constitution Act of 1867, which says, in essence, that the delivery of health care services are, for the most part, the exclusive jurisdiction of the provinces. And so, um, in Canada, we have 19 public drug plans or public formularies, 10 provincial ones, three territorial ones, that's 13, and then the federal government runs Nine, it runs six more additional public drug plans that cover um, various 
segments of the population, as you can see listed there in the, in the, in the second bullet. So with the exception of those six federal drug plans, which are very um, finite and very small, relatively speaking, certainly relative to the, to the four big provinces, um, it is the provinces that ultimately make the decision about whether or not they want to fund a drug, which is why, as I mentioned a moment ago, you can have provinces opting in and opting out of this process. They can never be bound by it because legally, it's all ground in the Constitution Act. And the Constitution Act says very clearly, it is the exclusive jurisdiction of the provinces to deliver healthcare services. And that's been decided, by the way, not, not just in the context of the Constitution, but it's also been determined over many, many years of, of case law in this country. And then finally, just the, the last slide, um, listings. I'm going to use Ontario as, as an example. It's just one example of the way things are done. Um, note specifically the role of the executive officer in Ontario. You may or may not know this, but for those of you who do live in, who do live in Ontario, one person, one person, a non-elected civil servant has the power under legislation, uh, specifically two pieces of legislation, to make all decisions related to what drugs get publicly funded in the province, period. It is what we call unfettered discretion, meaning that it is within the purview of the executive officer entirely at their discretion about what drugs get funded and don't get funded in Ontario. And by the way, it goes far beyond just funding uh, in the context of this role. Now, that's not the same in other provinces where legally it is the responsibility of cabinet in most cases, so elected officials, uh, to make those same decisions. So that concludes uh, what I wanted to talk to you about this evening. Um, and so I'll pass it back over to ALS Canada to take us through the final part of our webinar. Okay, uh, it's Lisa Marquita speaking. Uh, hello again, everybody. So what we're gonna do now is basically, basically kind of build off of the great context that Ryan has provided to kind of just go through what, what does this mean uh, for us? And where are the opportunities uh, for us to advocate uh, moving forward? So in terms of where we're at right now, um, Ryan referenced the, um, the PCPA and the, the active negotiations, which was at the top of the, the list with the chart. Um, that uh, the, the last update we have of, uh, of drugs and active negotiation had Radicava on it. Um, that list, again, was released on September 30th, and it's the first time that we saw Radicava on that list. So we've, we've been kind of watching uh, to see when it will appear, and so uh, it was great to see that, yes, um, it is uh, now at a place where the PCPA has identified that it's on the list for active pricing negotiation. Um, which is a good heads up for us that there is some opportunity to perhaps start to influence and advocate. Um, a couple of other things have happened as well. Um, uh, as of November the 5th, uh, Radicava is, is commercially available. So some of you uh, may be aware and perhaps may have been among the 210 Canadians who were accessing the drug uh, through the Canadian supply program that was set up by the, the manufacturing in coordination with Health Canada. Um, so up until this point and for, the, for uh, a, a while longer perhaps, um, there will be a, a small, um, a, that small number of people who are uh, being transitioned on to uh, the commercially available supply. Um, and the goal there, as we understand it, is for people to be transitioned from that program of 210 people onto private insurance plans. Um, and that is uh, our understanding of the way that people are able to access the drug now through, through private insurance. Because public reimbursement has not concluded yet, there isn't an opportunity to access in that way. So again, it speaks to the opportunity for us to be able to position ourselves collectively as a community to start to advocate so we can influence, hopefully, the speed of those negotiations and decisions. Um, the other thing that we have learned is that until April of 2020, um, uh, people will be, um, through Health Canada's personal importation program, be able to continue to bring the generic drug into Canada. 
um, Health Canada issued a communication to that effect uh, at the end of last month. Uh, so that's our understanding of where we are currently. And in terms of what ALS Canada has been doing, I'm going to turn that over to Tammy to speak to. So there's a lot of formal and informal work that gets done, and there's also a lot of work that gets done um, that can be more public and stuff that can be more more uh, quiet. So we've been working in many, many different ways, and I think in May 2017, when we first saw the drug that had been approved by the FDA in the U.S., May 2017, we remember it fondly. It was a Friday afternoon at about 4 o'clock. And since then, there's been a lot of work. So we've been advocating to the company to be able to have them consider Canada as a marketplace. We've been working with the ALN, ALS clinicians across the country. We want to make sure that they are well informed so that they can support their patients and help them to make the best decisions for themselves personally. We also need them to understand what the access points are. We've been working with our partners in each of the societies across the country to, again, ensure that they're informed and have the most current information so that they can support their communities and their provinces. With Health Canada, we worked with them through the drug approval process, so that first point to get us to a notice of compliance. But then throughout this, we've been able to bring forward issues for our community. For instance, when it looked like the personal importation door was going to close, we were able to bring forward the concerns of our community about that to be able to help to have that door maintained open until at least April 2020. When it came to CADIS and that submission that we spoke about, ALS Canada did a survey and we were given a very short time frame to be able to provide patient input submission into the CADIS process. So we surveyed uh, Canadians across the country. We had over 500 respondents to the survey and then focus groups. We collated all of that information and provided that. That helped to again inform the process. We've also been involved with CADIS through other means such as their conferences to be able to again advocate because although we're dealing with the very specifics around this particular drug and where it is right now, we also are very aware of the system changes that need to take place to ensure that the realities of people living with ALS are taken into account and things such as quality of life measures really are appropriate for our community because they, uh, some of the ones that might be considered aren't always the ones that would be most important or appropriate for, our, for the people that are living with ALS in, in Canada. When it comes to the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance, when we found that it was kind of getting stuck and we weren't seeing the negotiations go anywhere and we weren't able to see publicly released information, we did work with Advocacy Solutions and they helped us to identify that actually writing a letter and asking them where it was at um, might help. And in fact, not that it necessarily was just this, but we did receive a communication shortly after our letter and an invitation to a meeting, which then we found out that the negotiation, pardon me, that the letter of engagement would be issued. Again, working with industry, and even when it comes to MT Pharma in this particular case, or many, many other um, organizations globally that we continue to meet with to make sure that they're considering Canada as a marketplace for their new therapies, for their clinical trials as they're giving consideration. And then, again, as I mentioned in the opening of the webinar, engaging our community, understanding what's important and where the community wants to go, helping to provide information as we are able to, to make sure that uh, the community has what they know, what they need to know. And we obviously engaged advocacy solutions in assistance with developing this plan. And as I stated earlier, we've been working with other health charities as well as organizations and our partners in Health Charities Coalition of Canada so that we can learn from the experiences of other diseases so hopefully we avoid some of the pitfalls that they've seen in theirs. So what's next? So immediately following this, we have a planned webinar for November 25th. At that particular webinar, we would anticipate being able to provide advocate, further advocacy training and support, more about how to tell your story and how that would relate, um, when and how to have a meeting with uh, an elected official, and some more detail in, in that area. 
We will be able to share with you at that point a toolkit for orientation and training, as well as an e-advocacy tool overview. And some of you may have actually engaged with us in January around a campaign and again in June when we were doing emails to uh, most recently in January, or pardon me, in June to the leaders of the federal um, parties that were uh, moving forward for the election. And earlier in January, where we were asking for access to therapies and for uh, research funding. After November 25th, we would anticipate having you be prepared to be able to request a meeting with your local elected representative. So that would be your um, MLA or your MPP, depending on your province. That would consider having a letter writing campaign where you would be writing to your own Minister of Health within your province, because as Ryan shared, obviously the provincial level is where a lot of this has to happen, but also requesting from your MLA or your MPP for them to engage with the Minister of Health. And then to be able to be prepared to post your advocacy efforts on your social channels and invite your network to join you in your work. We know that, as Ryan had identified, that bringing many voices to the table helps to elevate the concerns. And just as we had found with Health Canada and our engagement there, or when we went to CP P CPA, we know that they've already felt some of the pressure from our community and they are aware of it and have been looking for this to be coming through the process. So that's how you can participate um, or what's coming next. How you can participate is please let us know that you're, actor, that you're interested. Um, if you could email us at advocacy at ALS.ca, provide us a bit of information about yourself so that we know how you would like to be engaged with. We obviously want to and need to engage our provincial society partners across the country. So we will be sharing your interest with them so that they'll be able to be in contact with you as they're going about their provincial work as well. There's also the opportunity to engage with us on social media. And just as you did today and being able to find this webinar and to come forward, being able to tag us helps us again to be able to raise the voices. So that concludes our presentation for today. Um, we understand that there have been some questions about the therapy itself. And if you want to email those, um, we don't have the details about the specific therapies. That's not what we were coming today to be able to chat about. That was instead, this is instead about being able to advocate. And again, I just want to reiterate why we're doing this part of it. And it's really our purpose here today is to be able to ensure that all Canadians have equitable and timely access to this therapy. But as well, we understand that this is precedent setting for the next therapies that are in the pipeline as Norm alluded to. And so we really want to make sure that the system hears the voices of the ALS community and that we're able to help to remove those barriers and ensure that it's ready for the next therapies as well. Do you have any other questions? Yes. Um, <clears throat> A question regarding following the April 2020 um, timeline for personal importation, is that an indication of timelines for public funding? So we don't expect that the April 2020 may be an indication of, of timelines for public funding. We would hope that that may be an indication, but unfortunately, the two systems actually are not connected. So Health Canada relates specifically to personal importation, and they wanted to be able to ensure that people under, that people had the information so that they wouldn't be caught in caught short in this gap period. But it by no means indicates that the uh, reimbursement decisions may be concluded by that point. And as you could see in the very early diagram that we had, that we understand that process could take anywhere from 12 to uh, 24 months, but in fact, we have heard of other drugs that are in the pipeline that have been waiting uh, nine years now post Canada, Health Canada approval, and that's not where we want this to be stuck. Uh, Peter says thank you. Okay. <laughs> You're welcome, Peter.
No other questions at this time. As a reminder, there should be on your um, control panel a question box. If you would like to type your questions into there, um, that's where we'll be able to see them. Uh, so if, you know, give people a, a couple of, a minute or so to see if they, you know, give them some time to type their questions. Um, but as a reminder, it is through the uh, box. I see a couple of you have raised your hands um, in order to, as I said, in order to ask a question, if you're able to, please type it into the question box and then we'll be able to address the questions that way. I think it's important to also note that obviously this isn't the only activity that we will be doing or that we're doing. And we do anticipate, as I said, when this is new for us at ALS Canada and for our community. So we want to make sure that um, we're able to engage the community and, and manage expectations around that. The other piece, of, obviously, though, is that there's a lot of other work that's being undertaken. I mentioned the work that we've already done, but we continue to work on the system issues as well. And we're doing the parts that we can to be able to identify the barriers and, and help to remove them as well that can ongoing communication with Cal clinics as well to make sure that the uh, ALS clinicians across the country are well informed. And we really do, if you are considering this therapy, we really do encourage you to take the consult with your clinician to ensure that this is appropriate. They will also be able to help you to navigate the access points that are necessary, um, either with the company through their support system or within your own uh, insurance programs, whatever is required. So your, your ALS clinicians will have the information that's required. Um, so a question around what are some of the lessons learned from our experience? And do we foresee adapting any strategy based on these lessons? <laughs> Yeah, wow, I, great question. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we have enough time on our phone to talk about the lessons learned because everything that you have seen today are lessons learned already. I think lessons learned that we have had from other organizations is making sure that we do activate the community and that they do bring forward their voices. It's one thing for us as an organization to bring it forward, but it does make a difference when we're able to even be before government and to be able to say, you know, this issue matters. We know that even on the CADIS uh, submission that it made a difference to them, the vast number of people that contributed to that, and it really spoke to the unmet need and why they really needed to consider this. Um, so there's a couple of questions around the special access program specifically, sort of building off again, um, the length um, and um, whether or not how long that special access program will be continuing. So at this point, the information we have for the special access program, which would indicate that's the one through the company, yep. that? I think that is being navigated through the patient support program that the company has made available. Um, and so I think the length of time that that will be available will, will depend on the individual person and um, potentially their, uh, their uh, insurance coverage. Um, I'm not sure I know offhand how long the company is going to have it in place overall. So that's something that we can find out. Um, there was a question about whether this, the webinar will be available online for those who missed it today. Yes, it will be. Uh, we will be sharing that link as well over social media so that we can um, share it more broadly for those who were unable to attend today. And for for um, for those of you who are interested and in, in kind of chomping at the bit to, to be involved in this, we're going to really get into the nitty gritty of it at the, the next webinar on the on the 25th. Um, which will be a lot more uh, of kind of tools you can use. Uh, we'll have a, a, a page up on our website where you can download um, materials, those kinds of things. So if 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 what you've learned today uh, makes you interested in in continuing to to advocate and and work with us, um, that next webinar will be your opportunity to to really dig in. Um, and again, as with today's webinar, 
we will record it and make it make it available. We we see the value in offering the information live so people can ask questions, but we also know that you know everybody's schedules are different, and so um, there will be an opportunity if you're not able to be on the November 25th webinar for you to to get that information afterwards. Um, one of the questions is, uh, would there be support from ALS Canada in a letter writing campaign? Um, I believe that Lisa sort of already touched on that, given that, uh, as she mentioned, the next webinar will go into those tools um, a lot more in depth. Yeah, yeah. Um, for those of you who are familiar with some of the previous um, campaigns that have been done, the one that was uh, initiated by the community and then the one that we did in June, we're looking at making a similar type of tool available. Um, and so we can kind of walk through that um, again on the 25th. Um, and the the intention there um, would be uh, provincially targeted as well. So yes, we the short answer is yes, we will be making a supporting a letter writing campaign, absolutely. Um, and sort of similar in that vein, a question about um, seeing various ALS Canada staff members at meetings with Ontario government members, and are we hoping to see those listening will start setting up meetings with local members? And absolutely. so, yep. yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, abs absolutely. Um, outreach to your uh, local rep would absolutely be something um, that we would encourage you to do. And part of making the toolkit available is to support you in doing that. And Ryan and his team will be on that November 25th webinar as well. And they have tons of experience um, with providing training uh, and, and kind of giving you a sense of all of the different ingredients and ways that, that you can get involved and how to tell your story effectively and, and all of that stuff. Um, so yes, and I think the, one of the other things that we'll have an opportunity to figure out together moving forward will also be um, how do we communicate with one another about those meetings. Um, uh, and so we can, we can work through those details together. I think we absolutely are interested in learning about meetings that you are setting up and um, uh, providing tools to support you with that, but also making ourselves available to, to talk to you about, about those meetings. Um, so that you're appropriately uh, supported. So yes, a lot more to, to dig into together on that for sure. Um, and a couple of uh, questions around, just a couple more questions around sort of the practicalities around the current state of Radicava, um, i.e. being commercially available, private, whether or not yeah. it can be paid for out of pocket, et cetera. Um, a couple questions around that. So, um, our understanding is that currently uh, the opportunities to access the drug are through um, moving on to the uh, patient support program that the company has set up um, and, uh, and transitioning through to private insurance. And so should you have private insurance, it's a good idea to uh, to speak with your insurance provider, but also to um, to go through the uh, program that's been made available through MT Pharma to help you navigate that, uh, recognizing that it's um, a, a somewhat daunting task. Um, the, but can can the can the average person on the street go and and purchase um, the drug because the negotiations are not complete and the provinces have not made their decisions about reimbursement? That's not an, an opportunity that's available to people right now, and that speaks to why we're conducting um, this advocacy campaign. We also have a question on the practical effect of Radicava being commercially available but with no pricing established. <laughs> And that really speaks to yeah. that exact comment that it was a movement we understand to be able to make the make the transition onto um, personal insurance programs. Again, please uh, access your ALS clinician and they will be able to help you make those sorts of assessments. Thank you, sir. Any other? And just uh, for knowledge of those people on uh, who are signed in, with the questions being sent through, we do have a record of all of them. So if we um, have been unable to get to your question, please know that we do have them. And I will actually just flip back to the previous slide for a moment. So you have that advocacy at als.ca email, uh, where if you think of other questions following this, you are welcome to please send them through to that email. Um, at this time, are there, um, there is an additional question around um, advocacy work around the larger process, such as the Health Canada Review, um, and 
sort of aligning that with some other countries? Yes, there's a great deal of work that we're doing on, on the broader system issues so that Canadians will have access as early as possible to uh, new therapies, both, both through clinical trials as well as as things are being considered to come to market. Part of the concern around that gets into even deeper, as I call it, alphabet soup, and relates to some of the changes that are being proposed for PMPRB um, and in other areas. So for those issues, which are much broader, we're working in coalition approach with other organizations that are sharing similar issues. Uh, National Pharmacare is another subject area that we've been working on with our partners with the Health Charities Coalition of Canada and Best Medicines um, Coalition. So there are a number of areas that we are working on to be able to help to make sure that uh, Canadians will have timely and equitable access for all therapies in the future. Obviously a major concern for our community uh, and we want to make sure that there's a better way to have this happen. But as we said, today we're focusing on this specific area relating to PCPA because it's a very targeted approach. When we get into the other areas, they get very technical and we need to make sure that we're able to push the right button, if you would, at the right time. And that would take uh, that will take a lot longer to be able to have our community up to speed. And even as we do, and we understand that the approach to take with that is getting broader voices to the table. Are there any other questions at this time regarding um, how to participate, the presentation that was provided, uh, next steps? So again, if you could please share your, your name and location with us. Uh, we will be sharing your information with your provincial society so that they will be able to help utilize your interest in their advocacy work relating to their provincial health care system and the provincial government. Um, we would be pleased to be able to see your interest and to um, engage with you as we continue on this, on this initiative. Okay. All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you, and we appreciate your interest today and taking the time with us. Look forward to hearing uh, from many of you about the November 24th, November 25th webinar as well. Talk to many of you then. And thank you again to Norm and to Ryan from Advocacy Solutions. We really appreciate your support in this initiative. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.